Here we are, Morningwood Radio, going live here for the first time since High Rocks World Championships with your host, Hunter, undefeated world champion, world record holder, 5640, Hunter McIntyre on the pod yeah. right now, live from London. We got the world champ in the house. How are we doing today, boys? Dude, do you like how I changed my name from Thunderham to Undisputed Thunderham? Mate, mm. my my dream, my dream has come true, boys. I've made it. I've made <laughs> yeah. it. We got James Kelly on the podcast coming through with a staggering. Oh, I don't have the time. Shoot. Oh, right. James Kelly coming through eighth out of fifteen on the High Rocks World Championships. Dude, what did you come actually? What did you? What was your time? Sixty-five hey, minutes. Uh, can't tell, mate. One, one, one hour and twelve seconds. Thanks, mate. That might as one well be sixty-five minutes. Oh, oh please. Yo, Wad Zombie, oh, yeah. how do you always have time to? This guy Wad Zombie always has time to be on these shows. Always on the shows. Doesn't matter what time we're doing it. And if I'm on another show, they're somehow on it. Like I'm on Savon's show. I just need to know. Who is he? Do you have a job. Who is he? I have no clue. Have we ever found out who Wad Zombie is? No, dude. Play. It's, 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 it's issue yeah. with the internet. There's always just like people watching. You don't know who the fuck they are. No. I follow them. He he does some or she, I don't know, does some pretty good memes. Very funny. Yeah. No, it's like no, Richie no. Rich in a bathroom. <laughs> Where are you right now, Kelly? I'm I'm back in Brisbane. Um, Brisbane, Australia, mate. At my uh at my girlfriend's house, actually. She's just gone to bed, mate. So so it's about 7.34 p.m., yeah? yeah. Kelly's been trying to quiet. pitch me on having a thruple with him and his girlfriend for a long time now. Oh, please. I'm yeah. not the one pitching that. Dude, I'm you're the, the one, one pitching it, dude. Yeah. Kelly, Kelly of the yeah. night of the uh, after party tried to put a thumb in my ass. Ooh. Oh, yeah, and you know what? You loved it. You loved every millisecond he's got, of He's it. got tiny thumbs, and I got big ass cheeks, so he couldn't yeah. even get to the he couldn't even get to the core of the planet. Couldn't get through to the meat. No, couldn't get past no, the meat. It, James Kelly, though, has a ba- butt, uh, back butt. So I was able to put, like, just my th- – all I had to go was like this, and I was already in the center of James Kelly. He's got no ass. Right. I don't know what comes out of your mouth sometimes, hey. I'm just confused by how you've made it as far as you have without having an ass. Mate, I do have an ass. An no, ass? No, 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 no. Or, I do have an ass. No. That thing's flat as a pancake. Um. <laughs> What have you been doing since what Saturday, Sunday? Dude, I've just been in like a parallel universe of confusion and drinking, and it's okay. Like I, I wanted to do this. I've actually been spending a lot of time on this couch, um, but just just kind of having fun, man. Like you spend so much time training, and I'm a big believer in like you have to take like a big step back from training so that you can come back with intensity again. If you're always in it, then you're never really going to be like fully in it, if you know what I mean. So I already know athletes that have been like immediately back. Like we saw Dylan Scott putting in workouts like the day after bikes. championships, just heavy hours. And like to me, that's not intensity. If you're if you're always moving the same velocity, you're not changing speed. So like the difference between me being in steady state versus championship state needs to be a transformation. It's like the difference between Power Rangers. Like you have to be Mighty Morphin Power Ranger to be a Power Ranger, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You can't just be a fucking always in it, always wearing your superhero outfit, or you're never really going to be that super. So booze, a lot of city bikes. Um, a couple of my really good friends uh, are still here from Manchester, and we've just been kind of kicking it. Um, now we go to Amsterdam tomorrow morning on a train with, uh, George and we're, it's just going to be his 40th birthday. So I'm taking him out there and we're going to get pretty lit. You know, we're going to watch the section. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Have have you, have you been to Amsterdam before? I've never been like, you know, I wanted to be this debaucherous experience, but I'm imagining it's probably going to be some exploration. It's going to be some excitement, uh, some consumption, you know, it's not going to be as crazy as I think it like, you know, everyone's probably putting it up in their heads. Um, I've never been to Amsterdam, so I'll do whatever. Well, I think the yeah. big thing was before they made marijuana legal, 
in in the states and and there's so many states now that have it it was like oh the one place you can go besides california that is you know marijuana is legal but now it's kind of the mainstream and getting yeah. to be kind of legal everywhere so it's like okay the yeah. hype has mellowed out maybe no I, you know they just it. came out with an announcement that they don't want stag yeah. parties there anymore they don't want bachelorette parties and stag parties there anymore they're trying to change the culture mm. um and I kind of get that, but it's also kind of like the Bud Light thing. It's like they're trying to they're trying to shut down probably their most economically valuable customer. Because trust me, like you don't go to a bachelor or bachelorette party and not just spend tremendous amount tremendous amounts of money on booze, food, and wild times. Like you spend money on experiences. Mm-hmm. You're getting the big hotel room. You're balling out there. You're getting the big table. You're balling out there. You're buying the bottles of champagne. You're balling out there. So in my opinion, I think that's super stupid. Like, I don't know of anybody, any reason why anybody else goes to the Netherlands besides to go to Amsterdam to get fucked up. And maybe I'm not culturally aware of what goes on in Europe that way. But I mean, listen, like what's probably if I tell you Spain, what's the most iconic thing you think of when you go to Spain? Um, This might sound dumb. Running of the bulls. Exactly. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. So if yeah. I tell you if you're gonna go to Italy, what's like the city you think of going to, and what's the thing you think of going Italy. to? See? What's that? Rome. Paris. No, I said Italy. Oh, Italy. Italy. Yeah. It's, it's it's Rome. So Rome, and what's the thing you think of immediately when if you were gonna go see it? What's Coliseum. the thing? The, um, the exactly. Coliseum, yeah. So imagine if you said, "I don't want Americans or anybody coming around to. If you're going to come to Italy, we don't want you coming to Rome. We don't want you coming to the Colosseum. We're trying to knock that out. We're trying to develop a new chapter." I'd be like, "What?" So I, I think know. Vegas ran into that, and they tried to, you know, on on one marketing ploy uh, for the new new uh, year, they tried to like market it as like kid friendly and parent friendly, and I think they realized that this <laughs> it's not going to work. It's just stupid. Went back, yeah. It'd yeah. be like Disney all of a sudden, like, we're not as interested in having children anymore. We'd love to increase our adult, like, you know, just. We're going to have I, adult entertainment. <laughs> I think a lot of people are going to start to recognize, um, recognize that they're making branding decision mistakes. And, you know, it's okay if your city is known as the party city of Europe. It's okay, Netherlands. I don't think, to be honest, you guys bring any other value to the world. Mm. I'm just going to say it. Um, somebody from the Netherlands, you can get really upset with me for that, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm really excited about that. And then beyond that, I'm coming back to London, going to battle bunker. Uh, and then beyond that, we're going to go to start the hike. So Wait, are, are you, up. are you doing battle bunker regionals or are you not doing battle bunker regionals? No, I'm doing it. I'm launching the first one. I'm going to go in, make sure that everything's good to go. And the first one is where? Uh, it's in North Carolina at my buddy, Chris McNamara's gym, where I set the Murph world record. Um, shout out to everybody who did Murph and shout out to Murph. Um, I kind of didn't really make a post or anything, but I think that's the coolest workout and probably the coolest day of the year for fitness. Um, Kelly, yeah, let's find out more about you. The first thing I had to ask is who the fuck are you? No one's ever heard of you. And then all yeah. of a sudden you showed up. He's on the team. You started to do some pretty impressive things, and then, you know, you showed up, and you were just on the cusp of qualifying, and you missed it. And we'll get into that, what happened next afterwards, but where did this all come from? I mean, you, you, have you always been a fitness freak, or is this just a perfectly aligned thing where all of a sudden you stumbled into it? Man, I feel I feel honored that you – have said that I'm I'm a fitness freak. I'm tell you. I I don't think you've ever called anyone apart from yourself a fitness freak. Well, I don't know you yet, but maybe you could impress me. You have you impressed me thus far. I think Thanks, what you buddy. did. Um, by the way, and I don't want to distract you from what you're saying, but I think what you did was one of the most badass things that I've witnessed in sport to date. And I'll give you that yeah. level of compliment, and we'll get into that. But I kind of like that from Hunter McIntyre. Wow. I don't want to put the cart before the horse here. So tell me about your your background. Tell me about uh, where you're coming from, what you're doing, and how you got here. A little bit of a yeah, belt pitch. quite quite simply. Um, I come from a um, an Aussie rules background and a running background. Um, however, um, 
to be honest, I was I was never I was never like really good at one sport. Like I was I was good at Aussie rules. I was good at running. Played a bit of cricket. Um, but I never made it. Like I I I was just shy of representative teams. Um, just shy of um, you know, the Brisbane teams, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why um, I got kind of sucked into fitness was because of at a young age, I was told or I got, I got, yeah, I, I got told at a young age, if, if I wanted to be good at something, I, I had to work. I had to do a lot of work compared to anyone else. Hence why, mate, like, mm-hmm. You know, moving the um, the needle forward to now, like I'll be honest with you, I'm not I'm not great at any of the high rock stations. I'm not great at running. I'm just good across the board. Um, before high rocks, I did a lot of functional fitness competitions in um, Australia here, and did did pretty good at. Never really made it. Let's just say until last year. Um, I literally just, you know, threw myself out here and came over and, and, uh, decided to do Birmingham in October and then London in November, the high rocks races. And, um, my first race was at sub 60 on debut and, um, you know, I, I was coming in blind, mate. I was, um, I really didn't know what high rocks was. I I thought I trained for it, but I was really coming in blind. And um, lo and behold, I I I cracked the sixty, and then did a pretty uh, another impressive time in um in uh in London. And you know, have kind of learnt along the way how to you know get the most out of my body. So you know, to sum all that up, mate, like Friday night happened, and you know, like um. I'm the first to say that the only reason why I'm sitting here right now placed eighth um, in the world for high rocks is because of my mental stamina. It's not because of my running capacity or my aerobic endurance or the ability to push a sled. It's just because one, I, I, I know how to feisty fuckers. You guys mm-hmm. are. How, how do you know guys or. The women. No, I, uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't have any experience with Australian women, but I do have an experience. My buddy, Brent McCormack, shout out to him. He and I did modeling together in Barcelona and then we lived together in New York. And this fucking dude, we lived together in, in uh, Barcelona for like three months and we go into the gym and he was the one who always called me a shit cunt. You fucking shit cunt. You fucking piss cunt. Bro, with a fuck you, fuck you, fucking cunt. Everything <laughs> cunt this, cunt that. And I was, I hated him at first. But then we became best friends. But in the gym, we'd go to war. Then we'd go to freaking, uh, we'd go to soccer field. We'd go to war. We'd be running yeah. down the streets. We'd go to war. We'd go, we'd play squash. We'd go to war. There was never anything that we would do that he didn't want to go to war with me. Yeah. I don't know anybody like that. I'm the only person where if you and I are flipping a coin, I will make a bet out of it and I will destroy you. And yeah. if we're playing a board game, if we're playing a race and I just quickly learned about his culture and I went and visited and I spent some time with the guys over there and it's just, you're rowdy. But the, the best part about you guys is not only are you, are you rowdy, but you're, you're sportsmanlike in the way that in, in all aspects, you're fun about it. You're not, yeah. you guys aren't an asshole, uh, a bunch of yeah. assholes. I, I appreciate. And I don't know. There's something about your guys' culture. Like if I had to get in a gladiator room and I put a gladiator from every single nation, I'd probably fear Australians near the top just because you're the kind of guy that would kick dirt in my eye and then punch me in the back of the head kind of thing. You guys play dirty, but, you know, you play to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly right. I think we get brought up very competitively at a young age, What whatever sport we're playing. And that's exactly what I – what you know – my my childhood was literally that. Um, got brought up very competitively with my father being on the other end of that, um, and I pretty much can say that in a positive way now because I'm very harsh on myself 
with my fitness and my routines and stuff like that. Um, but mate, I'll be honest with you. Like we talk about, you know, running thresholds and the ability to push a sled 50 meters and your, and, and, and your times for that. Like I personally think that the, the one thing that we underestimate is just the, the mental capacity to fucking hurt. And, you know, that's one thing that I'm good at. Um, Can't and the, yeah, but, and well, yeah, yeah. But the, just, I, I, since the weekend, I've, you know, had a, a lot of time to just think. And I think that's no offense to Tommy, Daddy Hogan, but I think Tom Hogan and I are very similar athletes because, again, Tom, Tom's a phenomenal runner, but he's not the quickest out of the field. But we just know when when we need to fucking push um, and we know how, how to dig deep. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where I've been, mate. And, yeah, li- literally the first season of High Rock. So I've got you no know idea where weird? The way well, that I can measure somebody's mental preparedness and readiness when you compete against them is by the angle of their chin. If you – and watch their eyes – if you're competing against a man, I don't say this stuff often. If you watch somebody with their chin down a lot, unless they're getting their head into like a chant and they're ready, but when they talk to you, if their chin's down and their eyes aren't up or above, you can tell that they're nervous. Right. And you can tell by a handshake, but sometimes people do that fucking creepy finger handshake, which I fucking hate. And that's another thing. People will squeeze your hands. I arm wrestled somebody on Saturday night, and the first thing he did was squeeze my hand as hard as he could and didn't even let me get to the hand, up to the grip of my hand. And I said, this cocksucker is going to die now. And I broke his arm off in the bar in front of everybody. But you can tell by somebody and the way that they grab your hand. You can tell by somebody the way that their chin is up and their eyes are up. You talk actually with your head up and sometimes back. And I watched you, and it seems that you're relaxed. And you can tell by somebody in the way that they're relaxed at the level that they're going to compete at. Um, at least something. Hey, that hey, I can, can I just, did you notice that when, do you remember like, and you just uh, released your YouTube video of Friday night. Did you notice that when we first met in the warmer yeah, area? Yeah. We were over yeah. by the bikes. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well. You can just tell, you can tell if someone shakes your hand and looks down, you know that they're scared or you can just tell by the way that their eyes are shaped. Um, and people can be very manipulative and they, they know that you can read them so that they'll give you like a counter activity to basically psych you out. Yeah. Um, yeah. and there's deeper levels of games, but I'm just talking about from original level of awareness. Um, that's something that I pick up on is people's posture. And if you study that kind of stuff and the way that they're moving, the way that they're smiling, the way that they're thinking, you can tell like sometimes when people make a lot of noise and if it's fake, it's very easy to catch on to. Um, Yeah. But you had that, which was interesting. And you obviously reflected it. So let's get into the more interesting uh, part of this conversation because you did not qualify for the elite 15, even though I think you competed almost at a, at a more regular level than almost anybody this season from the farthest place on the possible planet to come from. Uh, you about 30 minutes, maybe 60, I don't even, I don't know how many, less than 60 minutes before the championship, you were made aware that you were able to compete uh, at championships because Tim Winnish had strained his, his inner thigh and I want to know what that was like. And I heard from a bunch of people, by the way, that you knew something was coming without even knowing it was coming. You just felt that you were going to be ready to compete. Yeah, man. Um, Tom, Tom Hogan can kind of vouch me here where after Hong Kong, so Tom and I were ranked um, 16th and 17th going into the Hong Kong race, what, three weeks, two, two weeks ago now. Obviously, Tom um, ended up getting that 15th spot and I was ranked uh, 16th. So I was coming over to Hong Kong, to Manchester anyway, to compete in the age groups. Um, 
But honestly, um, the whole time um, with time up, up my sleeve, I, I thought someone was going to drop out. I thought at least someone was going to drop out. You know, and time went on. Um, the the middle weekend um, with 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 no events on, you know, came and went. The the Monday of the race, you know, the tapering week came and went, and then it got to Friday. Um, and honestly, mate, I I still had this sneaky. I, I can't a suspicion or this feeling that I was still going to race on on Friday night. To the point where I messaged Mintra um, and literally just told her once again that I'm going to be there um, and whether it's not, whether it's five minutes before the gun goes off, I'll, I'll be ready if someone does pull out. And I sent her that message with no reply, by the way, Mintra, um, at 9.15 in the morning on Friday. Anyway, like, you know, fr fr Friday comes around, I'll, you know, Friday happens, I register for my age group race, um, go back to the venue, and I was packing a bag for the venue to watch yourself, obviously, for, for the girls as well, to do the opening ceremony. Something inside me was like, nah, James, fucking pack your shoes, pack your run, um, pack your... I, I heard otherwise from a private story, James. But we'll keep that private. Yeah, we'll keep we'll keep that private. Yep. Sorry, I'm 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 just talking here, Hunter. Um, I was um, pack yeah, I fucking I, I I was just like, no, pack everything, you know. So I packed what I needed. I packed what I normally have beforehand. Pack my food. Pack the caffeine stuff I have. I was just like, no, I fucking bring it. Anyway, seven thirty comes around. The girls are what? Huh. Halfway through the race, I end up going, nah, I need to go to the bathroom, come out, and the warm-up area is right there. And I look over, and no offense to Tim, and I was, uh, he, he was obviously heartbroken. I felt so sorry for him, but he was on the ground with his father, like in tears, absolutely in tears. George Edwards um, actually approached me um, out of nowhere and saw it as well. George was great because I didn't want to be the one to just jump in Tim's face to be like, hey, man, are you not racing? Because that's not right. George didn't do that either. George hustled his way around other people to understand what was, what had happened. And um, long story short, George did the work to get onto Christian uh, to let him know that Tim was injured and not been able to race and James is fucking ready to rumble. And that was that was about quarter to eight before us being announced at, what, eight o'clock. Um, yeah, and that, that's what happened, man. And, and, and as, as you just asked, yeah, I fucking, I, the whole time, had this fucking little thing inside me saying, nah, you're, you're fucking racing. Um, and then here I am now. <laughs> now, something that I picked up on, I was reading through my notes. I uh, Something that I picked up on through doing shows like Broken Skull Ranch and a couple other projects where you just didn't know when you were competing a lot of the time. I often had to teach myself to do like cold, like cold call, show up, and just throw down when the call came in type training where I would just not decide when I was going to train. And I would just randomly pick an hour throughout the day based, not based off of what I ate when I was ready, whatever I would go in, I would barely warm up and I'd go full intensity into a workout at like a world class level because you never knew when these race directors or, you know, production houses were just going to come and get you out of the trailer and say, it's time, time to go. Because sometimes they'd say, you're going to go in five minutes. 90 minutes later, you still are not going. Oh, shoot, something went wrong with the lights. Oh, sorry, this, that, and the other thing. And I recognized that the only way I was going to get better at this kind of stuff was to go and do this kind of training on my own. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you picked it up just because you were like a football player and all these different kind of sports when you were younger. 
But I guarantee that if you'd done that same exact thing to the majority of the other guys in the Elite 15, they would not have been able to step in and do the level of performance that you did. Now, here's the second part of this. You were ranked 17th, correct? I was ranked 16th on 16th. Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're ranked 16th. You finished 8th. What do you yeah. think the difference between you and those seven other spots were? Why did you, with the least amount of information, the least amount of time and, you know, preparation technically for this style of a race, um, were you able to come in and beat those other seven people? I, I put it down to um, a couple of things. I put it down to that mental strength, mental stamina, mental grit if you if you will um um i feel like i feel like i thrive on not pressure because you know what i if anyone had fucking no pressure on friday night but i felt like a number of other athletes felt the pressure and 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 couldn't handle it but for myself um i because of my circumstance i embraced that the opportunity of just like, you know, 30 minutes out knowing and racing. Um, I, had I am nothing, nothing to lose. You'd already I, won. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But I'll be honest with you. You know, it's my first high rock season. So who, who am I to say, right? But, you know, the elite 15, there's such a stigma behind it, which is obviously marketed very well. But what's the difference between the the 14th, 13th ranked, ranked athlete compared to the 20th ranked? Fucking shit all. And what, what, one thing that I've noticed, and I really noticed on Friday night or even on the weekend in general, is that, we're most we're, we're mostly just fucking weekend warriors. We're not fucking elite athletes yet. Like, like if you can't turn up when the heat's on, you know, like you've got to go back to a drawing board. Now that's a big statement because I'm fresh. I'm fucking new to this sport, but you can't have these. You can't have these. I don't know, athletes being told that they're 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 podium contenders and then you know like not producing the goods or i i know there's other circumstances and there's other variables etc cetera, etc cetera, but i just think it's just just a lot of social media um influence as well that we get on the daily if someone's very vocal on social media and they do it in the right way, geez, like they're, they're, they're a force to be reckoned with, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to adapt to it myself as well. Well, I was thinking about this earlier today and a lot of it's just like maturity timing. Yeah. Um, and capabilities is like another massive thing. Like if you just don't have the capabilities, then you just don't, are never going to make it. But I'll tell you, I started out my first Spartan race season. I took third in the world. Then I took fifth in the world. Then I took seventh in the world. Then I took sixth in the world. Then I took seventh. Then I took fifth. And, you know, at a certain point in that whole thing, I decided to kind of switch my priorities and I had this big kind of shift in my life. Something happened to me, kind of fucked me up mentally. I met this guy, Bobby Williams, who is my man guru, just a really good friend of mine. He kind of got my shit straight and told me how to prioritize my life and like what it really meant to be like a man and be a contender and be a fucking like a beast. And he made me feel like a boy. He's like, you're just a fucking boy. All you do is fuck, fight, drink beer and fuck around. He's like, that's not a man. He's like, I'm a man. I've jerked off since I was 27. I don't lose things. I'm stronger than you. I'm faster than you and I'm twice your age. And I was like, I can't deny any of that. Teach me. So he taught me some stuff. And from that point on, I went first place, first place, first place. I've won every single championship that I wanted to compete in. I took first place in since 2016. 
except for my 2021 world championships um, for high rocks. But I've literally, um, I literally won everything and I had to make a decision and I had to make a decision to show up and it was across multiple sports. Often a lot of the people that are competing against me right now, like David McGee and I have competed against each other in three different sports. If I'm correct about that. Yeah. Three different sports. And it's, I don't know if anybody else has competed with me across that many sports, but my point is, is like, it is, it is a, it is a mentality. It is a level of physicality, but it is more of mentality. And mm-hmm. you can tell like this whole conversation we've been having about the way you see a person hold their chin up, you know, about the way you see somebody talking about the way you see somebody show up and do something when they're not supposed to, and just fucking do it. Nobody was talking about you before this. I didn't even know who you were. I kept on just like hearing from people being like, Oh, do you know about this James Kelly guy? James Kelly's pretty good. And I was like, yeah, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> and um, no offense to you, but I just didn't know. You don't yeah. know until you do know. And then you proved it to the world that with the least amount of information that you were able to show up and do more work than the other guys. And I bet you probably, if you had had a little bit more information and preparation for this thing, you probably would have even done better. Like some of the MVPs that I really liked was that Graham guy taking fifth, my buddy John Wynn that I coached. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I think he he really was third place. Um, and like, you know, these guys showed up with the least amount of buzz on them whatsoever and took down all these hypothetical, you know, hot shots. So James, yeah. with a with a hint of intuition that you could be, you know, I, I'm thinking out of my race tonight. You know, you you threw in your boots and and threw in all your race kit. What were you eating? Were you also like prepping for eating throughout the day too? Because obviously, you know, if you didn't think you were going to race, maybe that that Big Mac around the corner looked pretty good. But obviously, if you thought you were going to race, were you lining up your your food food intake? Uh, what you would do like if you were actually on the on the uh, on the top 15, like ready to race for that day? Yeah. Good question, Ron. I, I did, but I didn't like, um, I, I had, I had enough calories in me and I did that on purpose to make sure that if I did race, I had enough fuel in me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't have the exact, I don't know, meals that I like to eat before a race. No, but food is fuel and i i made i made sure i had enough fuel in me before mm. 7 p.m like i still remember i was with my mate freddie watching the the girls start and i bought one of those um pre-made fuel uh dinners that was that were being sold at the uh yeah. at the venue and i did that on purpose because i was like nah i should eat now it was about 6 30 or 6 15. I was like, no, I'm going to eat now. I'm going to eat now just in case. Like, seriously, it came, it came in my head. 6.15, 6.30. Uh, scoff this, like, rice and chicken thing down at about 6.30. Good. I had one of those. Yeah, that was late. That was yeah. Late. Just they don't get a gas station. I'm sick and tired of McDonald's not sponsoring me, dude. I, I smashed McDonald's also. So this is my first time eating apparently. McDonald's three nights in a row. I don't want healthy ass microwavable meals. I want Mickey D's. Apparently, McDonald's in the UK is different to America. Is that correct? Oh, dude. The United States, no offense, the greatest country in the entire world definitely has the lowest level of McDonald's. What like in terms of what lowest level of what? Well, you gotta understand everything is probably really? I had to guess everything that's being distributed from the United States is like in the United States out of the McDonald's shops is coming from a food processing center in the United States. And they're, they're coming from food processing centers over here. So different ingredients, food preparation, everything, it just tastes different. And I've even heard so much so that some of these, I'm not bashing McDonald's. If you guys are listening, I still want my sponsorship. I want to partner up, but some of these larger, uh, you know, larger companies are a little bit manipulative with the way they distribute things. Like you assume you're eating 100% beef. Well, the manipulation is they buy a company and they change the title of the company to 100% beef. So it's not actually 100% beef that you're eating. That's just the title of the company. So there's just a little smoke and mirrors in the game. So you might not eat be actually 100% beef. Um, you know, I, I'm giving you guys bastardized information, but I can tell you like the best 
double quarter pounder with cheese, which is my voting status. Like, you know how Dave Portnoy does a pizza review. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a channel where I do it for double quarter pounders with cheese and the Switzerland, the one in Switzerland and you know, is the best double quarter pounder with cheese in the entire world. Is this a well, new account in addition to like uh, Mr. Safari Bob? There's a there's a mysterious. Safari Bob, dude. I also have UGG lifts. Where I when I first got my UGGs, I was doing a lot of Olympic lifting in my UGGs. I I can snatch two twenty five in UGGs. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm a fucking boss. Um, let's do a little quick thing, real quick. We're gonna rapid fire some of these questions on the side, and then we're gonna go back into some questions I have for you. Yeah. Um. This is also a good one for you, Kelly. Tattooed Climber, do I offer personalized training programs? I want to qualify for champs next year and might as well do learn from the best. I do do personalized training, and I'm very selective with the people that I work with. I only have five athletes right now, and I usually pick them based on the fact that I like them rather than the fact that I think they're going to be a good athlete. Not that my athletes I have right now are not good. Like John Wynn, phenomenal performance. I don't think I'm probably the best coach for you. I think I, a part of the conversation I want to have with you, Kelly, is you are a coach. You should probably look for people like Kelly. I will admit, like, I have such limited time nowadays. I want people to get the best level of coaching possible. And the level of focus that I'm putting into coaching um, is not as high as it used to be. And I think there's so many other good coaches out there. I love to teach people everything. But that the focus that it takes to constantly – train you and periodize and understand your body. I'm just not putting it in at a high level the way I used to. Uh, it's not like I forgot how to do it. It's just, you know, I'm focused on myself, focused on building companies like builder focused on the show, which will give people more value than me coaching five people around the world. So with the limited time I have, I'm not putting it towards it. Um, Kelly, before we get into, hold on. Uh, Parker, I'm not going to answer that question. Don't want to help people that already suck. Um, how does it feel uh, about Zuckerberg going after his record? What does that mean? It doesn't mean like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Um, how can a 50 year old plus uh, athlete excel at the highest level? Kelly, you take that question first. Well, I, you got to prioritize Negus. Adrian, is it you got to prioritize recovery more than yeah, pro prioritize recovery, but also prioritize. Um, prioritize your time management more than anything. Not, not that I know I'm 29, mate, but geez, at, if I'm still competing at, at, at that age, I'll be a happy man. I feel like, yeah, you've got to prioritize the recovery more than even the actual training itself. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think you probably only want to train like one time intensely a week and make it very, very valuable, maybe two times. But I think so many people just have this, like they just go to sweat in the gym every single day for like a psychological response, more so than a training response. And most of the athletes I get my hands on, by the time I start to recognize the training that they were doing before, I recognize people just beat the fuck out of themselves all the time. And they don't understand the difference between intensity and low intensity. And that's why I was said earlier in the show is, you, your body only responds when you do things that make a metabolic shift in it or a nervous system shift in it and a muscular shift in it. You can only do that through very high levels of intensity where your body has to change itself physically to get stronger or fitter. And if you don't have enough low intensity, you'll never be able to have that high intensity that makes the shift. So typically like in the off season, I will not do almost, I'll do like one intense session a week and five days of low intensity, biking, jogging, swimming, hiking, whatever. So focus on having a really intense session, a lot of recovery. I think uh, Tom kind of uh, addressed that. And what he said was he doesn't necessarily do um, high rock specific workouts, but he just puts himself in a mode to where he, the, the training that he's doing for the day uh, accelerates his heart rate to the level of what it would be for the high rocks rate race. And so yeah. one of the days a week, you know, specific high rocks tracing, uh, training, but like the other days of the week, just for that recovery and being able to like train the next day, doesn't necessarily do sled pushes like he would be doing at the race, but just more of the aspect of like putting your, your body in that anaerobic type of, of, uh, feel spiking that heart rate. Yeah, it's 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 creating the same stimulus, but in a smarter way. Let's just say, 
mm-hmm. um, you know, not not using sleds, u- using bike erg or yeah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Dude, look at this. We've got some political battles going on in the comments. There's, That's when you know you start to build up guy. a podcast when people start to have their own arguments over here on the side. Um, <laughs> yeah. We made it. So, Kelly, the question that I yeah. had next is, is everybody – I notice a lot of athletes tend to have these, like, really incredible rookie years, and then they fucking never make it back. And I've watched it happen with so many athletes. They show up, they do really well, maybe they win something massive, um, and then they all of a sudden disappear. They don't have the balls that they used to. They didn't have the swag that they used to. The fear factor comes in. There's this level of fear where all of a sudden they put too much emphasis on it because they made it to somewhere they wanted to be, and next thing you know, now they just can't replicate that because they never really had that to begin with. And – what are you going to do to get into the elite 15 near next year? Because you probably, let's just say everybody increases their time by 30 to 60 seconds. Some people near the top probably won't, but you know, obviously that's probably going to shift, you know, the qualifying time to probably 58s and 57s. Um, Yep. What do you have planned? So the first thing, sorry, just give me one second. I just got to put my, Bloody, uh, you're really, just, you're really just dragging oh, ass on the show right now, aren't you? There we go. No, hey, so we have the first record thing of live viewers, we're at 60 right now. This is the, the most hot, the, Mate, the these, highest these. live watched show we've ever done. So, hey, that's I think, it. Well, you might be famous. Yeah. I think that's I am. Okay. I don't think people are showing yeah. up for me. This has everything to do with you, Kelly. Mm-hmm. It's the accent. And, it's the accent. And Ryan. Um, to answer that question, it's quite simple for me. First of all, um, jo- Georgie and I are moving to Europe. Um, are you really? The, yeah. For Where? Germany for now. Why? Um, because why not? Uh, my business is going really well and most of my athletes are over there. And two, Georgie and I have always wanted to live abroad. Um, I'm going to do a huge favor. Don't fucking go to Germany. Mate, why? <laughs> why? Because I, 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 I'll, 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 I'll just be straight up with you. I, I'm more well-traveled than you are. And of all the places you can go and have a good time, that's not near the top of the list. And if yeah, you want to be at a high level, the one thing I've recognized – the more sunny days that you have, the more likely you are to get out there. You're living in Australia. You live this cush life where you hang out with a hot girlfriend. You go down to the beach. Everything's all fucking cool. And then you're going to move to Germany and this depression is going to set in. And I guarantee your season is going to be fucked. Oh, fair, like, so where she go? I straight up moved to Colorado and I thought I would have another good season. And I got there and I was there for three months and I literally moved out of a fucking a mansion that was all set up right where I wanted it to be. But the weather was such shit. I said, no, I was like, you got to prioritize what's really most valuable to you right now. And no offense to your clients. Like these people are going to stop calling you as soon as you stop training them. And if you want to be remembered for something during this period of time, you better prioritize the things that are most valuable and you'll get more clients by being more successful. You'll get more successful by being around more successful people and you're going to find better athletes and better climates. So I would go to Spain. I would go to Portugal. I would stop fucking around just because you got some people you can train in Germany. Yeah, and that probably and is going to start a fight between I, you and your girlfriend. And I'm I'm opting out after and he's this. Already put that deposit down on his flat, and he's probably got the car <laughs> car spot all pre prepaid. No, we 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 understand that, and to- totally like understand from coming from Australia, mate. It's 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 our winter and it's 25 degrees sunny like every day here. So we, we totally understand the, the, the whole change of scenery change, change of weather, etc. We're going to start in Germany um, and, you know, see, see what happens. Um, the third and final and, and let's just say most important thing is the, like the reason as well is to be over there for racing. Um, mate, I've, I qualified slash I was the 16th rank from 
having to fly 24 hours to get to my fucking races this year. And I'm the first to say that, like, I hate people talking about, oh, the bloody, like, my um, flight was um, so long that I didn't race well yesterday. Mate, I, this year, I chose this. It, it wasn't as if I got made to come over for the four races I did and show up. I chose to do it. I fucking chose to because I wanted to and because I wanted to be in that elite 15. When, um, are, you, when are you moving? Um, middle of August. So Sydney High Rocks and then we're taking off. How long is your plan to be there in Germany? You said you're going to start off in Germany. I bet you... I'll bet you a thousand bucks that as soon as you start racing in January, your performance is going to drop off. Mm-hmm. Make a bet. A thousand bucks. Yeah. Make a bet. Uh, I bet I'll, you you'll, I'll, you'll have good races in the fall, and then your first two races in January and February are going to be shitty. All right, but can h- how can we measure that? I, I are you just saying going you have a clock? You have a clock. Yeah, it, <laughs> you're just going on time. Yeah, well, well, the process behind that well, just because it's otherwise. Do you want me to take out one of those charts that you see in like a little doctor's office for children? Like, pick which face are you? And you're like, there's the smiley face. There's the line face. There's the frowny face. That's like, exactly. Like, that's, oh, yours. That's, that's exactly what we do down here, mate. Now, that's I'll, I'll fucking that I'll shake on that. Measure everything in I'll, life? I'll sh- a thousand dollars that my first two 2024 race won't be better than my... um. My last one of 2023. Yeah. 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 And no sandbagging. I know you're not a pussy, but, um, yeah, that's my bet to you. And so like, are you just saying that because of moving climates? Is that the sole reason? Oh yeah. Dude, I've just, I've tried, I've been doing this for 12 years. I started out in Malibu, then I went to Vermont, then I went to New York City, then I went back to Malibu. I was in Malibu for two years, going back and forth to Colorado. Then I went to Miami, then I came back to Malibu. Then I I just like bounced all over the place and spent time in Europe and the United States, and I just kind of gone to all different climates and stuff. And there's a reason why I live in Malibu. It's not like in Malibu, there's nobody my age. I have to like fly people in to come and train with me and have them come push me. But I'll tell you what, 90, like 300 and let's say 20 days out of the year are such insanely impeccable weather that I can wake up in the morning and do four hour bike rides and all this kind of stuff. There's never a day in the week where I have an excuse and you're going to start to run into the rain and then the cold and the ice and everything's going to start to stack up. And you're used to this, just these sunny beaches and blah, blah, blah. You wait and see. It's a warning from a friend. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate the warning, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We've, we've got that plan for now and um, we'll see. Yeah. yeah. So tell me at this point, you know, if you're building a season – and you're building a life for next year, like what is the ideal situation for you? You know, I've, I've, you, you probably weren't thinking about this too heavily a year ago, but now you're like in it immersed so much that you guys are now moving to Europe. You probably have some high expectations and goals. And you yeah, probably do, mate. Want, like, do yeah. you want to build out your coaching business? Do you want to focus more on the racing? Do you want to get some sponsors? Are you going to try to open up a gym? Like what's the, uh, what's the gym yeah. game plan? Bit of everything, mate. Um, I know for a fact that we, we, and I say we confidently, that we want to establish opening up a gym back in Australia at some point. That that's a that that's a goal long term. Short term, mate, and I'm I'm talking short term, like the next five years. Um, I feel you know I'm 29. I feel like I've got a good five years of 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 racing still in me at least. Um, I want to continue to just... Is that right? And how old are you? 34. Oh. So, well, 
So, all right. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, four years. No, yeah, yeah, five years. I'm 29. So, I like, mate, I love Hyrox that much so far. And I say so far, man, I'm still, I've raced five times. I'm, I'm still new. Like, um, I can see you me progressing. Like marathons, Ironmans, any of this kind of stuff? Yeah. I, so I did six marathons when I just finished school. Um, I did a two, I did three 250 marathons. Um, those were my fastest times. Um, no, no, no Ironmans or swims or anything like that. But yeah, like a solid endurance background, let's just say. But mate, yeah, long, long, long term, I um, long term, I see uh, you know, you know, at least a few years of high rocks racing and high rocks coaching to end up um, creating our own, you know, gym and and hybrid style studio back home on the sunny coast of Queensland. Yeah. Look at That's this. You already goal. got you already got somebody shitting on your German plans. So have you thought uh, about growing a pair of balls? And coming to do the uh, starvation triathlon with us in July because I texted your girlfriend. I said, I "Listen, you did. I do. I need to borrow James, mate. Um, mate. I'm. I'm not. I'm not a. It, it's too soon because I'm doing a marathon in June. June? No, that's July. Called, that's called training. That's perfect. No, July. July sixteenth. I've got the Cairns Marathon. Where's Cairns? Cairns is like up, like up north Queensland, where where the crocodile. You've already done, you've already done six marathons. The more I think about that, it it seems redundant at this point, and seems like a mistake. And um, I could I could be wrong, but being that I have so much experience, I think I might not be. You you're such a salesman, are you, dude? Yeah, I'm mate. Just, I'm trying to help you I, figure your life out here. You're going to be running a flat line for 26 miles while me. <laughs> And my big brass balls are going to be doing an Ironman. I'm going to swim at high altitude. Then I'm going to bike throughout the mountains for tens of thousands. I'm going to run over mountain peaks for another 7,000 feet. So by the Hmm. end of this, my body will be leathered and tough. And yours is going to be soft like the bottom of a kitten's belly. Georgie (laughs) said, the only way I can go is if Dina lets Tom come. Tom will probably come. Or he's fine. I can't see Tom and Lycra. Can you see Tom Tom and Lycra? Tom's done a bunch of Ironmans. Has he actually? Yeah, Yeah. he's done a ton. That's the reason reason behind his tattoo on his on his calf. Yeah. Oh, I've seen that. um, Yeah. Oh, sorry. Your cheese and kisses. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So we're doing this as a team building exercise. I'm offering you. I'm reaching out this olive branch. I'm extending you and letting you know. Basically, all the advice I've tried to give you on this call, you've basically just snipped it. Oh, I, like, I, I am still going to move to Germany. I am still going to do this. But no, listen, it's it's a conversation. That's why it's great. You know, if I is, was just um, talking, is um is George involved? George is going to do the Ironman with us in in uh, Denmark, Copenhagen. When's that? Ju- August twenty second. August 22nd. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. We have a big summer ahead of us. Yeah. What's the, what's next after that Ironman? Uh, I will probably go after the Murph world record again in the fall. Well, hey, you know, Chris Woolley's having a crack at that this weekend. He'll do phenomenal. He's good. I just personally want to break 30 minutes, and I think I got it in me. I've just done the math on it. And I had it in me before. Like I, I, I had it in me physically to run a 52 this weekend at World Championships, and I just didn't put it together. By the end, mm. like my heart rate was was easy. I just didn't put it together, and I kind of pulled off the gas pedal. And the same thing happened to me when I did Murph. So I think with a better strategy and longer build up, um, it will happen. So for that world record hunter, um. Are, are you able to have, because I know last time there was some uh, back and forth between getting like the uh, Guinness World Records people out there. Guinness World Records can get fucked. Yeah. So how are you going to verify that it's it's the official world record time? Because I'm going to film it and then I'm going to email it to Guinness World Record and tell them to get fucked. 
All right, there we go. Get fucked. I, I hate that company. Anybody who's listening to this, I want you guys to understand that company is a fucking sham. Ooh. It is a sham. It is as Mickey Mouse as any company I've ever seen. It is a fucking, it is a, it is a kid's meal at McDonald's. It's a damn joke. The toys in yeah, McDonald's. Are so how do you get in the book? Yeah, how do you get a Guinness Book Record? If no, it's, it's not a Guinness World Record. Condition. It's just a world record. Listen, I've recognized in this space that nobody is going to validate anything you do. So you just validate it yourself and do better than everybody else who's going to try. You film the whole thing. You show the fuck up. You be a beast. And if anybody questions you, say, watch the tape and buy some builder and sip on it while you're watching, pal. Because I'm sick of your shit. I'm sick of all your shit. I'm the only person who's going out there trying to do these things. And no, there's other people, but I'm just saying, like, don't give me shit for trying to do something awesome, all right? You bunch of haters. What you happened to the world record of, of uh, doing as many step up to a box as possible? That's, that's called, uh, called Chad. Chad could be in the mix, too. But Chad's not as interesting. Chad's yeah. not as interesting. I've got more heart on the game for Murph. You know, I tried to apply with Guinness Book of World Records to be the fastest marathon at 200 pounds. And they're like, we are not interested in that. It doesn't really doesn't fall into the categories. And then I just sent them an email. They have like a dozen marathon records. They're like, fastest marathon done in a clown outfit. Fastest marathon done in a suit, a suit and tie. Right. I'm like, you guys are a bunch of fuckheads. I'm trying to do something that's amazing for society and the athletic community. And you fuckheads would rather me wear a clown nose so that I could be validated by your book. Dude, I don't even get them. It's a money making. You know, they took a thousand dollars from me when I applied for the Murph thing and they never, they never did anything. They just replied to me. No. And that was what their answer was. I spent a thousand dollars to get the word no from them. So guys do not apply to that, that racket of a company. God, I hate yeah. them. Okay. Tell us how you really feel. Change change of subject, kind of, but um, didn't Nick Bear beat your marathon time? Yeah, he did. Oh, he did. That's because he did more marathons. I could do that with my hands tied behind my. I also trained for five days for that marathon, and and Bear's been going at it for twelve, sixteen weeks to get that time. Yeah, yeah. So, so you did a two fifty marathon off a five day training block. (laughs) Yeah, it was just. It was just show up and run. And, you know, the, my biggest mistake in that was, like, I didn't start running until the half marathon point. And I was like, everyone's like, the wall's coming, the wall. The wall never came. It just sucked from start to finish. You're just running. You know, I think the thing is, is, like, you you believe the hype that everybody else is giving you about how hard things are. Um, and everything's hard. It's just as hard as you want to make it. So, you know. Yeah. But. Um, and then just get back fully into high rock season, you know, next year, I really am interested in, in, in getting all the doubles, uh, mixed and male doubles and do mixed relay records. I think it'd be dope to have a finishing year with all four records. Are you going to try to qualify in men's pro, uh, individual and men's double pro? No. Oh. I'm just going to qualify for men's pro, but I'll get the world record in men's double, the world's record in, in mixed uh, in men's doubles. I'll get the world record in mixed relay. Do you have a short list of people that you want to do the uh, uh, mixed double or doubles with? I don't know if Kent remembers this, but we were drunk at a bar talking about it. And we said yes. And right. then, you know, I've already talked about it with Megan Jacoby. We said yes. And then I bet you for mixed doubles, Kent and I and Jacoby in, in weeks – take that that's gonna be pretty hard to beat mm-hmm. so, so I think that'll be interesting are you saying that next year is your last season probably i said 35 you know if god came down from the clouds and came and sat right next to me and he's hunter one more year i may do it you do one yeah i i don't really have um yeah I don't really yeah. have a goal here. Hold on. Yeah. Michael Park, I'm going to serve you a bag of shit so you can mm. eat it and shut up. I had Chris McNamara, who's one of the best CrossFit judges and athletes uh, on the East Coast, counting every single rep. So um, why don't you suck on that sock, Michael Park? Okay. Nobody gives a shit about Andrew Hiller and his weird YouTube videos. Well, I think you just need to get like a judge oh, that would yeah. be like top of the game. You get Magita to to time you, and then it'll be official. Mm-hmm. 
No, dude, we had, we had the whole thing. It was all set up, film, judges, marks, everything, the wheel rollout, all that kind of stuff. So it's as good as it's going to get, you know. What do you think? What do you think Chris Willie will do this weekend? Time it. What? I think he's, I think he's a good thirty-one guy, thirty-one, thirty-two guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It Hard really depends. It depends on the weather. Mm. Also, hot days, dude. I regret doing it in such a humid space. Like if I could do it over again, I'd probably, that's why I'm looking at doing it in the fall. If you do it in a, like a colder climate without the humidity, I think that would drop the heat completely. And I may, I, I would ch change my outfit up a little bit. I think core temperature is like one of these kind of things. Once you overheat, it gets you good. You also do it in super shoes. Like I didn't do it in super shoes last time. Like What's you do it in super shoe? shoes, I bet you I could take 60 seconds off, 30 to 60 seconds off. What's a super shoe? It's, you know, the carbon plate shoes. Mm. Nobody seems to give a damn about using carbon plate shoes anymore. So uh, Michael Park is 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 loving you. He he, he, he hates you, but he knows everything about what your reps were, what, He's what man, you're dude. doing with probably, it. He probably has me as a background of his phone. Mm -hmm. probably, <laughs> probably looks at my pictures every night before he goes to bed. Probably you think he's done, man. Girlfriend. Yeah. You know, Michael Park's a fan. I appreciate it, Michael Park. Fan. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good to have people that talk shit. Otherwise, you know, you've got no adversity. Mm -hmm. You ever get home from a run where there's a lot of wind in your face and afterwards you hated it during it, but afterwards you kind of like flexing, you got a little bit of a pump. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of resistance I'm looking for from haters. Um, are there any other ambitions you have going on besides, you know, high rocks next season and moving to Germany? Like, you know, there's gotta be something you're interested in. Do you, are you into like charitable donations towards animals and, uh, rare, rare parts of Queensland? Are you, yeah. uh, no, you you're making me feel bad. No, no. Do you have one of those kind of things where you make like beads, ne beaded necklaces and you sell them on the beach? <laughs> No, mate, you, you haven't been to Australia, have you? And what, you're, you're planning to soon or? Depends. Pot potentially. Wherever the sun shines brightest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, mate, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm full in on my hybrid training business, um, setting up myself for a, a good high rock season next year. And um, if there's any sponsorships and, and, uh, people out there to help um i'd uh i'd love to chat i guess yeah um i'm a pretty simple man hunter um feel like i'm a lot more sim simpler than than you are i'm not thinking crazy shit yet <laughs> i might like i'm like i think i will one day i think i will think crazy but not right now I'm a very complex and uh, twisted man, so you don't want to dig down deep into this skull. But I'm glad that we got to know about yours. Now we're going to rapid fire all these questions. Now, the way rapid fire questions work from the internet is you're not supposed to talk for too long. Unless you raise your hand, you say you really want to get into some kind of prolific statement. Mm. There's Gosh, a lot of these shit. things, so we are going to try to so, answer. And, and after this, can we talk about some Aussie rhyme slang? Yeah. Okay, see all. Look at this, guys. We have a fuck ton of these things. Okay. Um, um, skinny legs PT. What was with the middle finger of Megita? My finger was cramping. Uh, D hand forty four. How do you ever? How, how did he manage to travel basically around the world to these high rocks races? How, how did you do it? How did you get so rich, Mister Kelly? So rich, man. So rich. I what I was just able to do it. <laughs> You save Talking. some money and, and yeah. Go. <laughs> yep. Okay. Peers slash PE. How does the elite 15 plan their new program straight after world championships? What do you do? What, how do you, what's part of your like programming training? that you're going to focus on? Programming. Most? Bit of break, bit of rest and recovery, but um, a lot of volume running and, and strength uh, periodization now. And then um, as, as the, uh, as the races uh, come come along, you get stuck into the important specific stuff. Interesting. You should train with Tom Haviland. Hey. That guy's the strongest man in the universe, and I love him. 
He's in Australia somewhere. I would come to Australia for him in a heartbeat. The, like Who's 10 that? of the hottest come women in it? Australia could say, come down here and we'll just cater to you every want and need that you have for, for a month. And then Tom Havlin could message me and I would go straight to Tom's house. Tom, Tom Havlin. Is he is he in Sydney, isn't he? I have no clue, dude. He never shows his yeah. face in his posts. He's incredible. <laughs> He's a freak. Dude. He? he deadlifts 500, a thousand pounds. He zerker squats 700 pounds. Holy hell. This is what I care about in life. Yeah. Dude, he is a freak. Okay, high rocks prep with limited time, five hours a week. I would say you should run for about three of them and then spend gym mixed up between the two for two hours. What about you? What would you say? Yeah, great. Running running 60% of it and then gym. Yeah, exactly the same. I would do one solid long run. Melissa Cokes, what's the hardest part of high rocks for you? Um, The start line. Literally the start line because you fucking know how hard it's going to hurt the next 60 minutes. <laughs> I hate the wall balls. Why? Just because it's 100 reps between me and the finish line. I just I have to, like, count it out. I never train wall balls either. Just no need. Um, any athletes that aren't currently doing high rocks that you think would uh, do big things? Mm. But just some really heavy, heavier triathletes, heavier cyclists, heavier uh, cross country skiers who do really, really well. You know, I don't know anybody specifically. Nobody from the high uh, CrossFit community is light enough or fast enough. But I don't know anybody you think. I got um, Lionel Sanders. He's pretty skinny. Yeah, he's, he's, he's slim. Maybe 160, 155. Mm. Yeah, he's yeah. Do you follow it? Do do you follow him at all? I like Sanders. He's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. intense dude. How did you feel being part of the Elite Fifteen when you knew thirty minutes prior to the process? You kind of already answered that. that. What was the yeah. JK mindset like, considering the scale of the race with so little time to prepare? What was the mindset? You kind of answered that, but is there like one Australian word that you'd use? <laughs> Not really, to be honest. I I I just simply knew I I was going to compete. I was never going in at fifteenth, you know, like at sixteenth place. I was always going to fucking compete, and I knew that from 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 when the gun went off. Yeah. Had Had you done any sims before where you're like, I know I have this qualifying time, but I got this in me because of of X Y Z that I did in training for a sim. Yeah, yeah. I I knew I was up there with with the big boys. Um. So, you know, placing, pl placing 16th was heartbreaking in Hong Kong, to be completely honest. So uh, when I got the opportunity 30 minutes prior on Friday night, I was fucking there to, to, um, to compete, you know? Yeah. Um, what shoe do you recommend? Joshua Fow said. Mate, <laughs> it's a funny question. I am not, I'm like by far a shooby. I've got these Nike fucking nim not Nimbuses. I've got these Nike fly nets that I have always raced in, but I just like them because they've done me wonders my my journey. And I just I I don't understand this whole like talk about shoes. I really don't. Just don't buy shoes and wear shoes that are slip ons. You'd be good. Exactly what somebody bro, would, like, would say. Bro, no, but like. Yeah. You you don't buy shoes out there that that aren't grippy in the first place. All shoes are gonna like unless they're fucking Dunlop volleys, <laughs> they're gonna be fine. <laughs> one of these days you'll learn. It's okay. Number yeah, eight. you know what? I I probably will one day. <laughs> How many hours do you train a week? Uh, twelve to fourteen. Fourteen. I didn't even know that was a number. What's a typical day of eating look like for you from Wesley Henning? About three three thousand five hundred cows, a lot of rice, a lot of porridge. I know house cats. <laughs> yeah. what, what do you eat for breakfast, then, Hunter? Red meat, fully full bodied no. animals. A fully like, eaten bear, like legit. No, no, you don't. Yeah, I wake up and eat steak from the night before quite often. I usually don't eat that much before my um 
before I start training it, usually all liquid. So I'll wake up and have coffee and honey with some protein in it or a mass gainer. And uh, the mass gainer has 150 grams of carbohydrates and 30 grams of carbs. So, you know, You're that's sweet, why I'm so freaking yeah. juicy. That's why my butt fills up the room, <laughs> fills up a pair of jeans. When I, when you put my jeans on, dude, it looked like you were wearing <laughs> a poncho. <right? laughs> the real man's body looks like. I need to talk it. It was like <laughs> lending a like a five year old a pair of pants of mine. Oh my he's, he's dripping all over him. What <laughs> stage did you know you couldn't be caught? Surprise, no one out there went with me. Uh, from Dunk McRae. At least from my standpoint, I knew before the race, and they didn't go out with me because they couldn't hang. Do you really do you train abs, James Kelly? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, my my girlfriend and I sometimes do a. We, we sometimes YouTube like a 10 minute ab finisher and we do a 10 minute ab finisher together. Dude, booty pump 10,000. It, it fucking works. Some of them are deadly. Hey, there's this one guy that's just like absolutely shredded. I think Georgie likes it when we <laughs> chuck him on, actually. <laughs> that's good. Um, Georgie Wesley. Vesley? Is he submissive or dominant in bed? Mm. I bet you're submissive, dude. I can just tell by that little smirk right there. You just lay down there like a bedpost. I think, I think it depends on the um the weather, to be completely honest. And oh, I think you and the depends. southern hemisphere are gonna be uh, <laughs> when you move to the northern hemisphere, dude, things are gonna be a lot more difficult for you. Have I think it depends on flow. I think it depends on Georgie's mood, to be honest. Thanks, Georgie. Thanks, Georgie. Uram.roar. What do you say? What stays makes you stay hungry for more titles and PRs? What's your version of the answer? Uh, um, fucking just bettering myself. I, I I don't know. Just just keep on fucking bettering myself. That constant strive to get better. Yeah. Constantly strive to get better. I was I'm not here to... Yeah, yeah. I think it's Mashumi, Mashimoto, greatest samurai of all time, greatest swordsman. And part of the book, they talk about how these samurais, um, like swordsmanship started to increase throughout time. And with that, the amount of sword, um, like the sword makers increased, obviously. So it like went from like 50 to 300 to 600, like really, really high level swordsmen. And they talk about the process of making a sword. You learn how to beat the steel differently every single time. And the more you do it, then all of a sudden like this version breaks. And then you find out that hitting it X amount of times versus X plus two or X minus two is going to make a stronger sword. And throughout time, you refine your process. And now all of a sudden you have the strongest and sharpest blade on the entire planet or the best version of yourself. You can only make the best version of yourself. You can only create what you have with the capabilities of doing it that moment in time. That's what I'm doing. I'm building samurai swords and the fucking harder I work, the deeper it cuts. And sometimes you go over the top and you break your blade, if you know what I mean. And I've done that. So that's just yeah. my mindset. Yeah. I'm a fucking craftsman. A uh, number of uh, one equipment uh, for a home gym for improving high rocks time. Skier. Uh, rower. Rower. <sighs> Rowers for pussies. You're saying what okay. sets you apart on, on giving you that push is that first station, the ski? Just an opinion from the best. All right. Facts. Oh, uh, Ron, if you think about – sorry, just, just on that. If you think about when on to races – that's that's where he ultimately gets people already like it's the the skier he he comes in sometimes with one or two but then he leaves 15 20 seconds after so then why do you say the race really truly starts after the sled push because you can put the gas pedal down harder or not like if you guys notice I, I i was gonna level up i had already gained i think two minutes and 26 seconds by the time i got to burpee broad jump and at that point i was not able to level up my body wasn't ready for it so that's when i started to pull back and you can have the decision like that's where i could have gotten that five minutes you know what i mean like that's where you could fucking go 
you can't go from the start. Otherwise, you'll run into this problem. Skier, I think, is just better because it's more – I study the VO2 max and the bodies and the explosiveness and the anatomical version of the way that your body works throughout high rocks and the skier is more beneficial than anything. Hmm. That's just a rookie decision. Yeah. It's just one man's opinion. Just one simple man's opinion. Um, Let's see. Did James Kelly tell his missus he wants to try making it with his wife from Dom Specchio? Specchio. Dom Specchio. He has a bunch of tats. He's a builder ambassador. I think he's just giving you shit. Oh, he is. Thanks, my pro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really have anything else in here that's really interesting. Uh, dude, I really had a good time. I did not know who you, you too, were man. a week ago. Now I know you well, and I had a really damn good time with you. Uh, Thanks for having me on. I wish you the best, dude. I want you to have a great marathon. I want you to enjoy Germany. Thanks. I want you to enjoy your lovely girlfriend. And I want you to be proud of yourself. Uh, What you did was probably the most interesting story of the High Rocks World Championships. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. And congratulations to you once again, mate. I feel good. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll um, hopefully be lining up with you again sometime soon. Not if you live in Germany. <laughs> um, well, pal, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, I'll end on this note. Some really cool things that we have going on. Uh, Battle Bunkers coming up next weekend. We will be in North Carolina. You're going to get to see some amazing athletes compete. We're going to be starting the process of that. Other than that, guys, we've got uh, the Summer Shred starting. That's our bodybuilding package that I think all athletes should do is reset their body with a good bodybuilding package. Someone's on their phone and I can hear you fucking around. Um, I think it's incredibly important to train your body that way. And if you guys think I'm wrong, stick to what you're doing. I'll see you guys at the next finish line. And last but not least, I want to thank everybody who supported us with Builder this weekend. Um, We had hundreds of people come up and get the free swag and drink. And we're really grateful. It's grown so much in a year. We're trying to get back with as many opportunities as possible. Next year is going to be better than ever. And um, I just want to thank you guys so much for supporting. I'd like to say thank you to Ellen. Uh, Ellen was the transporter of all the water bottles and then post meet and greet. There's Tetris sealing all all the stuff back in. So thank you. I just want to give a shout out to Hogan. Hogan's currently right now on vacation while I'm working hard and he's trying to get out of coming to the UK to have a business meeting with me. Hogan, I'll put staples in your ass cheeks if you don't get here. Um, for quit being lazy, sipping on whatever the hell you are in this Italian vacation spot that you're at. Um, guys, this is it over and out. I'll probably catch you one more time on the morning wood radio before I disappear into the woods. Actually, this probably, this might be the last, but we're out boys. See you lads. Thanks, please. Ellie. Love you boys. Yeah. Ryan, I'm calling you. I got to call you and get some work done. I know. Kelly, get some beauty rest. I can see wrinkles under your eyes. (laughs) See you, boys. Thank you. Yeah. Later, bro.